Good morning. We'd like to welcome everybody to the Mesa City Council session, study session for March the 2nd. All of our council is present today. Uh, the first item on our agenda for this minute, for this meeting, is the approval of executive session minutes. Council, is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Luna. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, something we've been looking forward to. It's good to have Mayor Smith back with us. Uh, the uh, agenda item is to hear a presentation and discuss Valley Metro Regional Transit Services, including bus, rail, and paratransit in Mesa. Mayor Smith, uh, we're, we're proud of you, proud of the great work you continue to do for the city of Mesa, and appreciate your uh, you coming back and updating us on the things we, we need to know as a council. Uh, so thank you for accepting this invitation, and we're looking forward to, I'm sure this will be a, a discussion and we'll have some good questions for you, but thank you so much for being here and bringing some great staff people with you. Thank you, Mayor. This on automatically. Thank you, Mayor uh, and Council. Boy, it's, it's great to be here. As I was telling people, I think this is the earliest I've ever been for a Thursday morning study session in, uh, in my history. So it was a new experience. Uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here and talk about something uh, that is, uh, has become near and dear to my heart. I'm, I'm sort of here as many things uh, uh, almost uh, by accident, but uh, a little over three years ago, I, I took on a six to nine month temporary uh, assignment to uh, work at Valley Metro and those things tend to work out that way. And I'm, I'm glad I've been able to stay because there's so many things we're gonna talk about today that impact not only our, our region, but specifically the city of Mesa. First of all, I wanna thank uh, Council Member Redia, who is our, uh, our board member uh, for, uh, for Valley Metro and Chris Brady, who, op who uh, participates in our, our two management groups. And, and just wanna start a little bit with, uh, and I, by the way, I have with me sitting off to my side, uh, Hillary Foose, who is our Director of Communications and Strategic Initiatives and Adrian Reese, who's our uh, safety and security director. Uh, and if you have any questions that I, I can't make up a good enough answer for, or else you don't accept, which, you know, either one of those could be there, uh, they're here to, uh, to help answer questions you, you might have. I wanna just begin real quickly and talk about Valley Metro, because Valley Metro to many people is a mystery. And uh, that's because you see our buses, you see the trains, but who exactly are we? Well, Valley Metro is actually two entities. Uh, the first entity is the Regional Public Transportation Authority, which is made up of 18 cities in the Maricopa County. And uh, the RPTA runs the bus and paratransit and van pool for areas outside of the city of Phoenix uh, and, uh, and paratransit regionally inside the city of Phoenix. Uh, it is a state, a public entity that, uh, uh, created by the legislature. Uh, and then we have Valley Metro Rail, Inc., that is a nonprofit corporation that was established by the cities of Mesa, Tempe, Phoenix, Chandler, and I think Glendale. It, is, it owns and operates light rail in the three cities. So the two boards that uh, Council Mayor Reddy are on are both the RPTA and Valley Metro Rail. However, we operate under one brand, Valley Metro. Uh, Valley Metro operates, as I said, the bus services outside the city of Phoenix, but if you drive around, you can't tell the difference between our buses and the city of Phoenix buses. Uh, city of Phoenix, we run about 60 plus percent of the routes. City of Phoenix carries about 60 percent of the, of the uh, passengers on a yearly basis. So as I go through and talk about Valley Metro, it's a uniform, and I'm CEO of both, both entities. Uh, so as we go through, we talk about Valley Metro, we talk about uh, the brand and not the legalese. Uh, we live to connect communities, enhance lives. We define communities as, as many things. Communities could be Mason and Phoenix, but it could also be your neighborhood, another neighborhood, you and your job, everything. And we, we, uh, we've established certain core values within our organization that really helps us to serve our customers. And we have multiple customer bases. Uh, number one, the people who ride our system, but number two, the cities, our members, you. You basically are both our client and our owner in many ways. So it makes for an unusual uh, and interesting relationship. Uh, and what, today we're gonna talk about all the different modes that we have because we certainly do have uh, a wide variety of ways. We carry more people than I think people realize. We have more impact than I think people understand, but it is, it is region wide. Uh, but we're gonna focus uh, a lot on light rail uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, light rail is, is, the show, is the show horse uh, buses uh, carry the most weight, which you'll see in a while, but also because it's one thing that right now impacts the city of Mesa with a uh, project that you have uh, that we're working on, and we just recently celebrated uh, 10 years. The other thing is when we talk public transportation now within the Metro Phoenix, uh, primarily the, the, the one issue that comes up, the most visible, is light rail. 
The most um, controversial is light rail. The one mode that drives the most discussion is light rail, uh, as it relates to not only light rail, but as far as transportation in the future. Light rail has, a, has had an indelible impact on the city of Mesa and this valley. And as we looked at that impact, we looked over the last 10 years and we created a quality of life report that said, what has happened in the last 10 years uh, with light rail as it opened in December of 2008? I'd like to go over just a couple of those things uh, very, very quickly. First of all, we carry over 16 million passengers a year, about 40, almost 45,000 passengers a day. Uh, as comparison, there was a bus line, a bus route that ran along the route of our light rail uh, prior to uh, light rail opening. It was called the red line. Uh, in 2007, the year before the red line opened, and it runs once again almost the exact same route, it carried 2.8 million passengers. Uh, light rail carries 16.5 million over this, basically the same route. So there is a difference between light rail service and bus service. We consistently pick, carry more a lot on light rail than we do on bus. If you look at the ability to carry people, and this, this has to do not only with the present, but also with the long-term future of public transportation, there is nothing more efficient and effective for carrying large numbers of people than rail and express bus. You just can't do it. As a matter of fact, right now, uh, light rail carries twice the number of people down Central Avenue in Phoenix as is possible with just cars. So it's a very effective and efficient way to move people uh, long distances especially. And our average trip is about six, six and a half miles. So that's it. The other thing is that light rail, while it doesn't create, nothing really creates economy, it certainly acts as a, as a magnet. And, and just like other fixed routes, uh, like a freeway, it attracts investment. As a matter of fact, there are 35,000 more jobs uh, along our light rail route than there were in 2008 when we opened. If you're familiar with this area, and those of us who have been around, you know that where light rail runs wasn't ex had seen better days, let's put it that way. There's been a lot of resurgence, a lot of renewal, revitalization, and new investment that has come into that, into that area. And that has brought a lot of people living inside the donut hole. Uh, Metro Phoenix, like everyone else in, in Mesa, I was, as a, as a home builder and developer, I was shocked when things that used to be out on the outskirts of town were all of a sudden inner city and uh, development, the donut hole. What we've done is we've brought new living, uh, almost 25,000 residential units along the route, including over 2,200 workforce and affordable housing units. So we have brought people back inside the donut hole and created that. The investment in real estate is real. This is, these are not uh, figures that have been created by an economist, no multiplier effects. We, we actually track real estate activity inside our route, 26 miles, half mile on either side, and there's been over $11 billion in, uh, in real estate investment since light rail opened in, along our route. That's, those are actual dollars that have been spent inside. So by any stretch of the imagination, objective standards, if you look at the success of light rail in 10 years, it has exceeded any and all projections. Ridership is, is almost twice what it was projected. Investment is, is many times over what was projected by those objective standards. And Mesa has been also a recipient of this, uh, of this investment. We see here Encore on Forest. I can tell you that, uh, first, these are multifamily type housing. I can tell you that these would not exist without light rail because I was here and understood the, the process that went through. We started out with senior housing, with uh, workforce housing, and, if, and with uh, things such as La Mesita, but we've moved on now to where there are projects currently under construction that you all know about that are moving into the market rate development and others that are on the books. As a matter of fact, the last time we, uh, uh, we checked and I, I wrote a, a, an op-ed for the Arizona Republic and I claimed that, uh, <coughs> that there was over uh, $300 million in new investment in, in the city of Mesa for either projects that have been built, aren't planned, or have been announced. Uh, and the Arizona Republic called Jeff McVeigh to fact check that and found out I was wrong. Jeff told them that it had, it had blown past $400 million. Now that's taken in context, if you look at it, uh, that's pretty significant because in the 30 years before 2015, there was barely a single new home building permit issued inside uh, downtown Mesa. A lot of rehab, but virtually no new home. So we went from zero to 60 real fast and that is continuing. Many people asked me when I was mayor, uh, what impact will there be on, on light rail? I mean, will it change downtown? I said, I don't know, come back in 10 years, you can tell me. This is not an overnight type of thing. Light rail's now been open a little over three years in Mesa. We're seeing some of the initial, but really come back in six to eight years and we'll see the real impact of what this investment has had. Let me talk a little bit about our regional system because light rail truly is a regional transportation member of that. This is the, this is the map that has officially been uh, 
uh, been uh, approved at MAG and as part of our regional transportation plan. You can see there's a lot of dates and a lot of potential uh, uh, extensions. You see uh, uh, Gilbert Road out there, 2019, some other things. And I'd like to go through some of the projects that are, uh, that are right now in, uh, in process and that are in planning. Uh, 50th Street, if you've driven down Washington around 50th Street, you see a new platform there, especially outside of the Ability 360. That's opening up next month. We're really excited about that. It'll serve an area of town and especially a, kind, uh, a segment of our population that, that truly relies on public transportation. And then, of course, Gilbert Road. Uh, we are rapidly coming to the end of construction. Uh, drove it this morning, and it looks really good. This is our first train going through the, uh, the roundabout there at Horn, which I know a lot of people are very excited about. Um, I, I, my record is my record is ten, cir ten circles in a row, uh, and my grandkids finally said, "Grandpa, this is really weird. Would you please get out of the loop?" But I will say that I've never encountered a, a car that didn't understand uh, the rules of the roundabout. I haven't been hit yet. We're excited about this, uh, and uh, as this as this goes through, uh, we think it'll be a real benefit to the community. Just last week, we uh, engaged in some testing, further testing of light rail. Uh, this was a significant test where we actually tested the power system. And in, to, to test the power system, what you do is you bring two trains, three, three, tra three car trains, and you simulate it being full of people. And then you start both trains at the same time to see if that load, uh, the, the load that, it, that takes the drag on the system will trip the system or not, because it has to be able to, uh, to uh, operate at the maximum, maximum uh, um, uh, capacity. Well, how do you simulate 30,000 pounds? full trains. Well, you can't get that many people. What you do is you fill it with bottled water. We used to put sandbags. When the, when the system was initially built, they put sandbags on there. Well, we put uh, pallets of, of water, little test, 30,000 pounds. How many gallons of water is that? Do your math. 46,000 46, gallons of water. Five by eight. Mr. Freeman knows that. I, they, you did learn something in the fire department, didn't you? I did. <laughs> Those of us who are older remember that if you went and you used to buy, buy a bag of ice and it was eight pounds. They since went to 10 pounds. But uh, these, uh, this water has not gone for waste. We are very been very happy to work with Dave Richens and uh, United Food Bank, and they were delivered to United Food Bank, and they will use that in their, in their distribution uh, system to uh, distribute those out. That passed. Uh, the, the, the system did pass. So we're, going, we're working toward, right now, a May 18th, opening uh, for, for service. That's the date that's been, uh, that our contractor is committed to. Uh, I will say that put that on as a heavy tentative. Things can always go wrong. We have uh, state government and federal government involved in, uh, in that process and that can always trip it up, but we're relying on May 18th and Jody Sorrell, uh, since she wants a birthday present, has told us we have to uh, do that. We're not going to, she's not gonna accept a belated birthday. Jody, your birthday's when? The 19th, 17th? 17th, okay. <laughs> Tempe Streetcar is under construction right now and moving toward a, a 2021 opening. Uh, that's a little bit of a picture of what the Tempe Streetcar is going to look like. A streetcar is very different than, the, uh, uh, than, a, uh, uh, than a light rail. It's a smaller unit. Uh, if you'll notice one thing on there is missing. Uh, if you'll notice in that picture, uh, let's see if we can figure out what's missing. Oh, you got it. What? Nothing the, upstairs. Heaven for above? Uh, the bear <laughs> looks at it. Yes, there's no wire above there. Yeah. Uh, this actually is a hybrid propulsion uh, unit, meaning that... Uh, uh, it runs on batteries as well as, uh, as being hooked up to the wire. Of uh, the 3.1 mile uh, route, about a little over a mile will be, especially down Mill Avenue, will be run uh, on batteries. So it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, interesting new concept that we have. <coughs> South Central Extension in downtown Phoenix uh, hub, uh, six miles and things that will really change things. We also just received uh, environmental clearance on the uh, most recent, on the proposed extension on the northwest side of our line, which is two miles that takes us over I-17 into Metro Center. So, uh, and then uh, also we're working on an extension from downtown Phoenix out to the Capitol, uh, Capitol 18th Avenue. What will this mean? Well, this, if, if the, when these extensions go through, this will completely change our system and Mesa will be uh, there. This is the system that we have now. As I tell everyone in all presentations, of course, the system begins in where? In Mesa, where all good things begin. Heads west to downtown Phoenix, then north up to 19th Avenue and Dunlop. This is where our system will be in 2019 after Gilbert Road is open. In 2023, with all the extensions I just talked about are completed, this is what our system will look like. And other than the colors being different, what you see is, 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 it may not seem significant, but it is very significant because it changes from a single line system into a two line system. 
one east-west or uh, once again beginning in Mesa, uh, ending up at the state capitol, and the other one north-south, which runs from baseline and, uh, uh, and central in Phoenix up to Metro Center uh, in northwest Phoenix, meeting in downtown. The downtown uh, hub, which will happen really in downtown, will be pretty exciting. A series of stations where it'll, it'll create sort of a, a Grand Central Station type of, uh, of effect, and we're very, very excited about that. And of course, the Tempe streetcar will be finished by then, as I've said, three, million, three mile uh, streetcar. Uh, in Mesa, we are undertaking and uh, uh, working with your staff on two studies that could impact light rail or high capacity, these are high capacity transportation uh, transit uh, studies. Uh, light rail, streetcar, bus, anything that's a high capacity. The first one is, is the Fiesta District Alternatives. Uh, the idea being that whatever high capacity route will connect with our light rail line and may perhaps and head in down Arizona Avenue, Country Club Arizona Avenue to Chandler at some point in time. That's uh, one that's very interesting. And then we've recently begun a, a Tempe Mesa streetcar feasibility. Uh, if you look at this, especially on Rio Salado, if you look at what uh, uh, Tempe and ASU have planned uh, along Rio Salado, which is the Novus Innovation Center going past Tempe Marketplace down to Sloan Park and Riverview, uh, there's a lot of talk about what if, uh, what if we extend it. We're going to need to extend either streetcar down Rio Salado or some kind of high capacity for this, this very simple reason. If you've driven down Rio Salado at any time, it's, a, it's already a mess. And it isn't hardly developed to about 10% of its possibility. ASU envisions almost 50,000 employees being along that real slaughter route. With the river to the north, <coughs> limited freeway access, you've got to find a place to move through that corridor, a way to move through that corridor more efficiently and effectively. And some sort of high capacity transit is going to be a part of that. The idea being that perhaps we could extend that into Mesa, make the real slaughter a true uh, 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 area that, that we envision, and then perhaps headed south to cook up with light rail to sort of form a loop. We're in the middle of that study right now to see if that's possible. We know it's possible, but is it practical? Does it make sense from a ridership? We also uh, have done some things I want to make you aware of. If you look at Valley Metro, even though we have a, a sort of dual systems between Valley Metro City Phoenix, we operate under one brand. Uh, and, uh, but if you look, our buses have about, what, 10, 12 different paint schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, and this sounds like a minor deal, but it's a big deal, the City of Phoenix and Valley Metro agreed that this is the new paint scheme going forward that uh, as we order all new buses, whether they be from the city of Phoenix or Valley Metro, they will carry this scheme. Our light rail uh, vehicles will also uh, carry this scheme as we repaint them now that they're 10 years old. So you see the purple and the yellow, or yellow, yeah, purple and, the, and the, uh, the, the lime green, and that become more prevalent as that gets in. I know that you, you've, had a, you, you've had to deal with a, a difficult question on paratransit. I won't spend a lot of time, because I know you've spent probably more time than any one of you ever wished for. <laughs> Uh, paratransit is a very small part of our budget and a very large part of our discussion region-wide. One thing we are moving toward, just so you'll know, is that Mesa is not alone in dealing with the challenges of how can we, how can we uh, serve this population, which is uh, incredibly needs it, both ADA, senior, others, while doing it uh, financi in a financially feasible way. Uh, as I think you, you heard from, from Jody in her presentations, uh, we're well over $40 a trip on paratransit, uh, and, and that is just not financially sustainable when you look at our region-wide. We also operate, operate under a variety of systems. As Mesa just redefined its paratransit service area, many other communities in the Valley have that same issue. Now, you, you can imagine what it's like trying to manage a system that has over 14 different rules, service areas, and things within one system. Uh, and, it, and it certainly makes it more difficult for us to provide quality service, but also to provide financially uh, sustainable service. And we're trying to move the region into a more consolidated, singular type of system, which frankly would follow the MESA approach. And several other communities in the region have already approached us uh, to, to get more information on what, you, what you've done here and to see what we can do. That's simply the reality of, of, of where we're dealing. I want to look at ridership a little bit. And this, this bar graph is a little bit uh, there aren't three different levels. It's just to tell you the levels of service. As you can see, uh, this is really only covers two types of service, bus and light rail. And then the purple is, is the, the total. It's a scale within a scale. So don't get confused for that. And you can see that overall ridership is, has gone down between bus and, and, and uh, light rail over the last five years. As a matter of fact, that, uh, that decrease started after 2009. Our, our peak was reached in the depth of the recession in 2009 and has gone down every year. 
uh, gone down on bus service, uh, all except for the last year where Phoenix uh, expanded its bus routes through its T2050 initiative. But this is not unusual. As a matter of fact, our change in our bus in our overall service is fairly good compared to other systems around the country. Many bus and rail systems have experienced 20 to 30 percent declines. Why is that? We'll get into that in just a second. We have, uh, while our bus services has, uh, has held steady, our light rail consistently increased until this last year. And we've sort of seen it for all 10 years, every year over year was, was uh, significant increases. In the last year, we have leveled off. We're down about four, four and a half percent in the last year. Mesa, though, uh, has increased, and we have not decreased as much as others. As a matter of fact, the numbers here, uh, just to tell you the change in light rail service over the years, uh, when the light rail ended uh, at Sycamore, uh, the last year it did in 2014, there were 946,000 boardings at Sycamore. Um, now that uh, we, we go clear to Mesa Drive, uh, in 2017, we boarded 2,290,000 boardings. So the, number of, the amount, number of people who have boarded in Mesa since the extension to Mesa Drive has more than doubled, gone from 950,000 to almost 2.3 million. In, two, in 2018, that dropped to 2,240,000, 2, about a 2% decrease. So we have, the, the ridership in Mesa on light rail has dropped less than the ridership uh, in other parts of the valley. Our biggest drop in ridership is, uh, uh, is interestingly enough, in Central Phoenix, where we have the highest density. Uh, so uh, Mesa, and Mesa still uh, is about on par with our percentage of, of uh, stations and of, of distance of rail. We're actually punching a little bit above our weight as far as the number of boardings as it relates to the amount of of, of rail miles. We actually board more people than we have a percentage of the system, just barely. Um, why is that the case? We've looked at it, and uh, I, I've gone to many national conferences, read a lot of articles. There is no simple explanation. No one can really tell. And I think one of the things we started looking at is, is ridership, are ridership numbers really a true indication of the success of public transportation? When you get down to it, we are a public service. We are not a whole lot different than many of the other things we do. I mean, you might want to call them amenities, although we're a specific amenity. Uh, and so we look at it, and, and, and the question is, is should we think that its success is defined by increased ridership? I think we can say that we all saw one phenomenon, which was ridership on public transportation spiked across the country in 2009, 2010. Was that a success of the system? I, I would think not, simply because people, $4 gallon, 11% unemployment, they went to public transportation. We've seen as the economy improves, job growth goes up, gas goes down to, to, to $2, uh, public transportation ridership goes down. That seems to be the most consistent um, uh, relationship that we can find. Uh, there's nothing else that really explains it. There's interesting studies that have been done to try and, uh, to try and um, further look at that. And there was one study that was done in Southern California by UCLA. And from 1990 to 2000, UCLA looked at population growth and its relationship to the number of new cars registered in the region. And in that period, there was about a little over 450,000 vehicles, which represented just 0.25 vehicles per resident. So in other words, uh, they must have had whatever four times that was uh, in population growth. So one in four new residents registered their car. Now, if you look at 2001 through 2017, that number changed significantly. <laughs> 2.1 million vehicles, which almost match the population growth. So in that period, in the last 20 years, you've, you've bought one, every new person comes in, brings a car with them, or adds a new car. There's been a dramatic shift in, in, in how we drive, and as cars become, uh, I don't want to say less expensive, because they're expensive, but as work changes and other things, as we spread out our workforce, and it, while they may not become less expensive, cars have become more affordable, uh, and since we don't change models as often, uh, it seems like the used car market, there's a lot of different reasons why people are driving. And what we've seen is as the economy improves, ridership goes down. Uh, you want to improve ridership on public transportation? Let's have another deep recession. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I'm happy with, with stable, uh, stable ridership if it means a great economy. But that's the best thing we can, we can look at. So what is the future? We've talked about changing and changes, because uh, this is a big question that I get a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are many people who believe that public transportation is, is, is a dinosaur that's going to, it's going to uh, you know, 
Peter into uh, a way into, into irrelevance. Um, there's no doubt that the world is changing. We, we see the, uh, the Waymo cars uh, all around here. We used to see the Google cars. Uh, there's no doubt that right now, technologically, we are almost to the point where we can put cars out on the street almost to a level five, which is full autonomy, no driver, no safety driver, nothing. Uh, there are still a couple of major technological things we have to get through. We have, uh, we, we, we recognize that we are going to live in a different environment five, 10, certainly 20 years from now than we do now. Where this environment is going to be a multimodal environment, it's going to be one that relies on a lot of different ways. And we have not fought that, we've embraced that. We actually have a pilot program going right now with Waymo uh, in, in Chandler uh, specifically, bleeding a little bit over to Mason to Gilbert. We actually have, uh, have several of our employees who live in that area who are utilizing Waymo on a first mile, last mile. We're learning a lot of things. Uh, we're learning how this will change transportation. I'll give you one example. We have one employee that takes the express bus in from South Chandler every day to downtown Phoenix. And if you take the express bus, it's a wonderful way to travel, except for it's very rigid. There's like four, routes, four uh, uh, buses in and four buses out. And if you miss one of those buses, you're, you're in, in deep trouble. And so that limits your, your flexibility if you're in downtown. Well, you know, it's one reason I would love to take the 535 in, but I usually don't because I can't live with my job with that kind of rigid schedule. So this employee realized that with Waymo, he doesn't have to take his single express bus. He can choose among four or five different express buses who will drop him off anywhere within a five, six mile range. And what he does is on his way home, whatever bus he takes, he just, he just uh, uh, gets on his smartphone, orders a Waymo, there's a Waymo waiting for him, takes him home. Now he has, he has changed the way he travels. Total flexibility, because those, those five different buses give him 25 options as opposed to four options. This, this is just, a, just a, a scratching the surface about how our mobility will change. We'll pick and choose different ways to travel. And we're looking at this. Uh, the future of mobility, I usually don't like to put a lot of quotes, but if I said this to you, uh, you probably would just sort of yawn. But if someone from McKinsey says it, uh, uh, then all of a sudden it has credibility. And I'm gonna read this, uh, I, don't, I don't like to. Ultimately, individual partnership will give way to having a mobility app on your phone where an automobile is but one mode available. A wealthy commuter might order a driverless Uber Black to take her to the office in solitude. A regular Joe could hail a robo shuttle that gets him to the subway just before his train departs for the city center, where he'll hop a pre-books e-scooter to carry him the last mile to work. This is the ideal future of mobility for a city. We actually have the, the technical capability to do that right now. We are participating in a, with the FTA in a study to create a mobile mobility on demand app. You can do it. There's a lot of things to overcome. Uh, but we know that this is, going to be the, this is going to be the future. The question is, will public transportation be, uh, be eliminated? I hardly think so. I think we will change. You'll see a very different one. Things like express buses and light rail will become more important, I believe, in the future as we move to more of a spoken hub. What you'll see is, is right now in the third, eastern third of Mesa, uh, you virtually have no bus service, which you've just discussed. Uh, putting uh, local service with regular buses is very expensive into that area, which is why we haven't done it. We don't have the money, you don't have the money to do it. We've tried to backfill with things such as paratransit. You see, that's even more expensive. What will happen in the future is that we'll be able to perhaps have many buses, other things that become neighborhood transport that take them to a, a, a light rail station, an express bus, something to go to uh, larger dif distances. Those may well be autonomous, they may not be autonomous. One thing that we have to realize with technology is that let's, let's not let technology get ahead of human nature. Um, I was, I sort of looked at, people would ask me, how fast do you think this, this uh, transition into autonomous vehicles, pure autonomous vehicles is gonna last? And I'm reminded, uh, there's two things. Number one, I was talking to uh, one of the developers, and they said, you know, the biggest hurdle we have to get over is that we can take it almost to the limit but there are certain things that a computer still cannot do. And use an example. If a person goes and stands in front of a car, autonomous vehicle, that car recognizes that as a human form. It will stop. What it cannot do is it cannot recognize the intentions of that person standing in front of the car. Is that a little kid that just ran out there or a person that, 
meandered in front of a car and is, uh, oops, sorry, and gets out of the way? Or is that someone who wanted to stop that car to do ill? Well, a human can look at the person and can make a judgment call as to whether they are, what their intentions are, and then can, can work to do that. A, a machine can't do that yet. And, and that's a huge problem. Uh, there's a huge problem with cybersecurity. Uh, but there's also a, a huge issue with, with human behavior. I was reminded of this the other, a couple weeks ago when I went over to, uh, to Empire Machinery, uh, their building right there on, on Country Club, uh, for me and East Valley Partnership early in the morning. And as I'm looking at a, uh, as I'm looking at a, uh, for a parking spot, um, I was amazed by the fact that nearly everybody backed into their parking spot and probably three-fourths of the vehicles were heavy-duty lifted pickup trucks. I mean, I don't think there was a 150 in the whole, uh, in the whole route. They were 250 and above. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. See, Mark, Mark that, that, you're kind of people, right? And I start thinking, Mark, uh, you know, I, are those people going to abandon that and the pleasure they get from that to get a car? It's going to take a long time for the transition to happen. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And we found this out, for example, in the Internet. I remember uh, uh, back in the early mid early to mid '90s, there was a, there was a one of the most famous dot com busts was a company called Webvan. You may or may not remember it. Webvan had this exciting idea that it was going to eliminate the need to build these thirty to fifty thousand square foot grocery stores. It was going to go warehouse and deliver groceries to your house. All you had to do was go on the internet and order it; it would deliver it. Massive failure. Technologically, they could do that. Realistically, nobody wanted or trusted the internet to deliver things like groceries to them. And so they failed. That was 25 years ago. Look at where we are today. It took 25 years. We're now, does anyone question whether they can order McDonald's, Amazon, anything? So technolo te technology may be quick, but human behavior is much more unpredictable. And it took 25 years before, you know, uh, before the web van model became a model has. And even at that point in time, uh, we look at Amazon. Amazon is a small percentage of total retail sales. I'd like to go into one thing now that we've talked a lot. So that's where I think the future is. I think it will be a mix. We will change. You will change. The world will change. But public transportation is not going to be irrelevant, for any, certainly in my lifetime and probably not in any of your lifetimes. If anything, we will be more focused. We'll deal with longer hauls, which makes things like express buses and light rail even more, even more important. I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the other questions we have on light rail, and that's how safe are you? Well, statistically speaking, our light rail system is extremely safe. In fact, you were statistically safer driving or riding from right in front here on light rail to downtown Phoenix than you were driving from your house to this meeting this morning. That's what the statistics show. The perception is much different. Uh, this is the first time a lot of people have been in a place where there are uh, the community gathers. And any time you gather in a community, you obviously have uh, an increase in incidents with human interaction. And the light rail experience is something you're in a, you're in a train. We find and we can tell you that our, our incidents of actual criminal activity are very, very low. Once again, statistically speaking, you're safer on one of our trains, trains from a criminal aspect than you are in most regional malls around the valley. Those are what statistics show. The perception can be different. We've implemented certain things such as respect the ride. This is our right and our wrong. If you've been on one of our trains, you see them. We've, with, through Adrian's leadership, we have upped the amount of, of security on our, on our trains. We've created paid fare zones to give our security and uh, uh, safety personnel more tools to work with. You can see we've increased the number of, uh, uh, of security personnel significantly, increased our budget. What's the percentage of our budget that's on security now? About 11 11%. 11, 11 it used to be 5%, so we've doubled our security, our security budget. Uh, and this has helped uh, in the last year. Uh, we've increased 32% our security personnel in the coverage, almost doubled the, the, the number of people with, with the coverage, and we've seen a 30% decrease in security incidents. Now, we call these security incidents because when you look at our incidences, they're very different than, than the criminal incidences. We have a lot of what we call trespass incidents, where people are misbehaving and the security officer asks them to leave the, the train or leave, and they say, no, I'm gonna stick around. They may be drunk, they're not hurting anyone, but they're really being obnoxious. Well, if that person refused to leave, we call the police. The police, obviously, they, they, tend to, uh, they tend to react to the police officer different. That's a trespass. That's reported as an incident. Our incidents use, uh, uh, seem to be small. They're what we call uh, respect the ride 
uh, incidences, uh, and that is open containers, loud behavior, radio, refusing to, to, uh, to follow a command. Our incidents of actual cri crime are very, very different. There's one, I, I, and I've read a lot that people say, you know, light rail creates crime. Well, light rail does not create crime. The City of Tempe Police Department actually did a study in 2015 to try and find out if there was a correlation between light rail and crime. What it found is a normal phenomenon. When people gather, the incidence of interaction increase. I, I, I don't know if you're gonna shock you, but at Riverview Park, there are more incidents involving police when the Cubs have a game than when there's no game. At Sun Devil Stadium, we have the same thing. We're a gathering place, 16 and a half million people. We do have these kind of interactions but they do not rise to the level of high criminal activity. And in fact, people have said, well, most of the crime in Mesa happens along light rail. That is the, from Comstat from last month. You can see Mesa looks like it's got chicken pox. Uh, unfortunately, crime is prevalent throughout the, throughout the uh, area. And we find that the, the incidence of crime is not significantly higher along our light rail than it is in other places. So um, we take it seriously because we recognize that perception becomes reality and we want people to feel safe uh, and we want people to be safe and so we are spending even more and more uh, of our resources and the Mesa PD is doing a wonderful job. If you wanna know what a good job they're doing, drive down Main Street at night, uh, like I do a lot as I check our line. Uh, it's almost unheard of for me to drive down Main Street in the evening and not see either the bike patrol or a Mesa PD uh, cruiser parked by a light rail line, a presence. They're not dealing with an incident, they may or may not be, but the presence is really good and we've seen that, we've seen that impact. Uh, so we still have some work to do. We're still working on that, but thank you to the Mesa Police Department. And we've done, we're doing the same thing with Tempe and with Phoenix as far as in creating this partnership to increase that, that incident. Uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about something that's been in the news lately and that's the anti-rail initiative in Phoenix. First of all, this is a city of Phoenix election, not regional. The region, uh, voters in the region, either independently or not, have voted three times on light rail actually four times on light rail. City of Phoenix uh, voters have voted twice within their city. City of Tempe has voted once. And then the region as a whole has voted once with Proposition 400 in 2004 on light rail. This uh, light rail, uh, this initiative is a, uh, is a citizen driven initiative uh, that, has, uh, that wants to undo what was approved by Phoenix voters in uh, August of 2015. It wants to carve out light rail and basically terminate the program. There has been an election call for August 27th, 2019. It not only stops any rail uh, development in Phoenix, but it also directs Phoenix to, uh, to, to use its best efforts to bring as much money out of the regional transportation fund as possible back to Phoenix. This obviously dif uh, creates difficulties as we try to go to a Prop 400 extension, working with other cities, because we look at our region as one bucket, but we obviously look at what each city brings in, uh, and uh, there's a lot of trade-offs that go on. The East Valley gives to the West Valley, Phoenix gives to the East Valley to create a regional transportation system. This could, uh, this will probably affect that. The other thing it does is it rejects the federal funds that are coming in. Um, light rail, projects like light rail, uh, the majority of the, of, the, of the cost is covered by the federal government. Uh, if those projects are ended, that money goes elsewhere. Uh, it is not redistributed uh, within, the, within the community. It, it only goes to rail projects and would go to rail, rail projects throughout the country. Our uh, federal source is a, is a, is a uh, called the, the Capital Investment uh, Grant Program. It's oversubscribed. There's more projects than there are gra is grant money as usual. So that money would go out. In this case, it would be over, over three and a half billion dollars that would go. It would also impact anything Mesa would wanna do in the future if you wanted to connect to uh, Phoenix, such as commuter rail, those kind of things. Phoenix would not be allowed to build any rail, such as commuter rail within their city. So it would basically kill uh, commuter rail. So it does have an impact on, on other cities other than Phoenix, although the most direct impact is on Phoenix alone. So that's August 27th, that uh, uh, you, you'll certainly hear a lot more about that as the election gets, it gets closer. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, I look at what I do and you ask why I've stuck around for the, the time uh, uh, since I was the interim, uh, well, that's it right there. Um, you know, the, most of the things that we do, uh, you do as a council and I do here, uh, we're not gonna reap the benefits from it. It's the next generation, generation after that. And the projects that we're involved in here are, are gener multi-generational projects. You know, light rail, a light rail car has a, has a life of 30 to 40 years. A light rail system of 50 to 100 years. 
these are, as I've said, the real benefits of the investments we make in any form of transportation. Yes, they have, they have current, present impact, but they really impact our communities in the future. That's why I'm involved. That's why I thank you so much for the support the city has given uh, to us at Valley Metro, and we look forward to uh, working together to uh, move forward. That's it. Thank you very much, Mayor Smith. Great, uh, great, present great presentation, great information. Uh, Council, I suspect there's some follow-up or, or questions here. Mr. Thompson. I'll start us off. Uh, Scott, thank you for coming in today and providing us uh, an in-depth uh, presentation. Uh, one of the things that I hear quite often is when is light rail uh, going to have a, an express rail? Uh, to get people from, you know, from Mesa to downtown Phoenix um, in a shorter time frame. Because right now, if you ride, it's 45-ish uh -huh. minutes to go from, you know, from Mesa, uh, from downtown Mesa to downtown Phoenix. And um, so a lot of people are asking about, or at least people that I talk to are asking if I think there's ever going to be a, an express rail. And so perfect opportunity to respond to that. Yeah, I would say uh, the answer is maybe. Uh, there's a difficulty in our system because it's a single line system. And most express systems, if you look in New York, Boston Place, they have, they have multiple lines. Uh, we have actually talked with uh, about once we finish this north, south, east, west system, it would be possible. And especially having an express route that would go from downtown Mesa, stop in downtown Tempe, and go to ASU downtown. And like every third train would be an express train. Those are things that we have on our planning horizon. Right now, we're limited by the number of cars we have. Uh, we have 50 cars in our system, which is barely enough to handle what we do now. We are looking to purchase, uh, we're getting another 11 cars delivered, uh, which are basically catch up. We didn't add any cars when we added, when we expanded into down into Mason Drive and up to Northwest. So we're playing catch up. We have an order on for over 100 new cars. If we get enough cars, the express service, which would probably be downtown to downtown with a stop in Tempe, is something we've looked at and we would seriously consider. I don't think you'll ever have one where it'll be, or, uh, maybe it'll be Gilbert Road, end of line, downtown Mesa, um, downtown Tempe, ASU, downtown. That would be the express line. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, Mayor Smith. Uh, what's driving the anti-light rail initiative? What, what what, what's going on? There? That's a great question. Uh, you know, there's some legitimate, you know, light rail should be debated. There's some legitimate issues. It's a big investment. Um, and there are, first of all, there, there are different stages that I've seen. There's, there are many people who are just ideologically opposed to public transportation in general. So anything that. There are other people who are opposed to light rail because they believe, uh, they believe that it's too expensive, that it's yesterday's technology, and that we look to the future and that it will be irrelevant. Uh, and, and that we could spend that money on other things. Um, and, and that seems to be driving it. There are then other people in, in South Phoenix, for example, who are afraid of the impact that rail has on their community, both from a construction and from a long-term uh, thing. You know, and I would answer those people, you know, we should debate whether light rail is good. I have to admit that uh, Glendale, when Glendale pulled out of light rail, I couldn't argue with the council's decision because it, it didn't seem like the right fit at that time for what Glendale was going to do. I have a very different opinion of South Phoenix, South Central. I believe it's a perfect fit. Light rail isn't for everybody, and it isn't for anywhere. Obviously, as a mayor, I supported, and I do now, the light rail through, through Mesa. I think it has changed our city for the better, and it will continue to change the city for the better. Um, one thing that I, that, that I understand why people would, would disagree with it, uh, but there seems to be a lot of misinformation. For example, light rail is very expensive. But light rail is actually more, much more efficient than buses. Uh, it, co it costs us less than half to operate per boarding than it does buses. So once you spend the money, it's the most efficient and effective method of transportation. As far as light rail and others being obsolete, you know, I find that interesting because Trains, yes, they're 150 years old. Well, cars are 120 years old, and planes are 115 years old. Somehow we think that cars and planes are just okay. We have evolved, and there's no doubt that, but we still use the same basic, uh, the same basic uh, uh, um, um, 
science is used, physics are used on those three things. We've evolved and, and we will use it differently. Uh, but that's what I see is, is, is mainly the part. There's, a, there's an ideological reason which is, goes beyond anything else. Uh, frankly, there's a lot of people just, you know, we, we hear this, they don't like those kind of people. You have all, all sorts. But the most legitimate are, there are people who have legitimate questions as to whether it's the most effective investment for that particular mode of transportation that we're in place. I, I think that's a legitimate question. And I would love to have a discussion with anybody to say, because I think in some places it is. I have people who ask me a Mesa question, when will light rail get to Gateway Airport? I said, probably never. Well, I won't say never, but not in my lifetime. It doesn't make sense. It, it just, for, for the benefits it would derive, it would just, there are other ways to accomplish that that are much better. I think light rail is a perfect uh, anecdote for, for downtown Mesa because of the multiple benefits that it brings uh, in addition to just moving people from point A to point B. Thank you. Mr. Freeman. Mayor, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Um, you talked about ridership in Mesa mm -hmm. and two point something million ridership. Was that just from the Mesa Drive platform or combined in all the platforms? No, I'll, I'll so give you I, a... I guess that's where I, for my information, and then I have a second follow-up. Uh, it, it's combined. I'll, I'll give you just a, just a, you know, where'd those numbers go? Jody probably has it on top of her brain. Oh, here it is. Uh, just an example. In, 2008, in 2018, 815,000 people boarded at Mesa Drive. Um, 157,000 right out here in front, uh, 405,000 at Country Club, 397,000 at Downland School, and 464,000 at Sycamore. Okay. So, you know, other than, uh, other than the Center Street, which we know is the, is the lowest used, uh, the end of line is always higher, uh, but the others are spread pretty, pretty evenly, about around 400,000 uh, boardings. Okay, thank you. My second question is, um, Maybe you can explain better for the public the uh, federal funding aspect, how the federal government pays for building the light rail and then the city's costs for the operation and maintenance and the breakdown from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, each project is, is unique and different, but there is one, usually one major component is that the federal government is involved. Uh, I mentioned the one fund, the, the capital investment uh, grant program or CIG program. Uh, that legally uh, can fund up to 80% of a rail project from the federal level. Realistically, it's 50% or lower as the federal share. And that is a competitive grant program, which is a, what we call a pipeline program, where you're in the pipeline for many years. It's an incredibly, uh, it's an unbelievably um, demanding project. It's, it's the way that if you, uh, if you look at how someone should give grant money, it should be the poster child. I mean, we go through a, a, a series over years of very, excruciating uh, steps to make sure that it's, that it's designed to be safe, efficient, effective. And then the FTA decides where, scores it and decides where it fits in against other pro projects around the country. So we are, we, we in Phoenix compete against Los Angeles and Seattle and Dallas and others. And the idea is, is to score, which is a combination of, of ridership, economic development, uh, ease of construction, those kind of things. There's a, there's a very uh, defined objective scoring platform. There's other monies that we use from the federal government, uh, congestion mitigation and air quality, CMAC funds, that Maricopa County through MAG, uh, that comes through the county and through MAG, MAG has designated that those be spent or allocated, our county's portion, to light rail construction projects. Um, Mesa utilized another uh, to build the Gilbert Road extension, and that is that we repurposed federal highway monies uh, for projects that had been identified within the city of Mesa that we were never going to build for one reason or another, such as uh, widening uh, Meridian Road to uh, 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 eight lanes in both ways was one of the projects, and we had to cover, what was it, 80% of that project. I, you know, us doing that at that rate. The Higley Road Expressway, anyone ever hear about that? Uh, there was a pro in, the, in the original 2004, Higley Road was to be an expressway with uh, uh, bridges and underpasses and, and limited access. Uh, you know, We looked at those and we said, oh, and there was a many other projects that were in our plan that were money allocated to Mesa that developers had gone in and developed property and therefore we didn't have to improve that intersection. We repurposed those monies uh, and used federal m highway monies to build light rail. You can't do that with local regional monies, but you can do that with federal monies. So Gilbert Road was built primarily with federal monies 
and I'm trying to think what the breakdown was. Jody? Federal versus local? It's all federal except for our local map. It's yeah. $10 million. $10 million. So you have a $180 million project, 170 of which was built basically with federal monies. So it varies. That one is, was a very high, <clears throat> high ratio of federal monies. Um, South Central will be probably 40 to 45% federal monies, 50% federal monies, and the others. And, and that's, that's generally how it will work, 40 to 50% federal monies. Overall, though, that's several billion dollars into the region. Thank you. I guess my last uh, thought was uh, Tuesday night, I, I drove from Grady Gamage on Main Street, Apache Boulevard, all the way east to the roundabout and saw just the construction, all the development through Tempe and then entering into Mesa. And then, you know, there's some uh, areas there that will be future develop development. But I do know that none of this development would not have happened except if the light were there. So, you know, I think that uh, our community in Mesa, there's a lot of development going to be happening along the light rail. So I'm glad you got your numbers fixed, 400 million from Jeff McVeigh, because <laughs> he, he knows the numbers. Um, and then with that, uh, you know, for us to manage the light rail extension from Mesa Drive to Gilbert Road, there'll be a lot of development happening in our community. You know, this is, when we go to Gilbert Road, uh, it'll be 28 miles. A lot of people say, well, it, nothing's developed on, for example, Main, Main Street between, um, except for La Mesita, well, it's 28 miles. That's a lot of real estate to develop, and it won't happen everywhere equally. Uh, development will be clustered in downtowns, around ASU, downtown Phoenix is completely transitioned since 2008, transformed since 2008. And there's no doubt that people are making decisions now to invest in the city centers, whereas they weren't. And there's only one common denominator, and if you go to downtown Phoenix, you know, we had stadiums there many years before we had development in downtown Phoenix. And all of a sudden, light rail comes in, and you get all this development. And when you talk to ASU, when you talk to others, they'll say, no, we, we're not there without light rail, because it's the type of investment that attracted, uh, attracted that, that kind of thing. The other thing to note is that uh, if you look at MAG's population estimates, we're going to add a million people in the next five to seven years. A million people. And it's not going to stop then. Uh, and those people, for the most part, are going to move inside the loops. So we're going to become more dense. We're going to crowd more traffic. And even if you're not, even if you're in Santan Valley or the West Tanks, you're going to work probably inside the loops. Uh, and if you'll talk to Eric Anderson at MAG, we are not building any more freeways. And we've run out of real estate to add lanes and to intersect. I mean, what we found out early in my tenure is that the width of the road doesn't matter. It's how you get people through the intersections. We simply don't have ways to get people through the intersections any more efficiently than we are. We're maxed out. Uh, I remember one of the big projects we did was University and Gilbert Road. That used to back up literally, if you remember on University, half a mile almost. Uh, and then we went through and did that massive widening, did not widen University, and now that's pretty, it's still there, but you can't, you can't widen that anymore. And so we're gonna have to find a way to move these million that then to be, that's just in the next five to seven years. What do we do in 10 years, in 20 years? We've gotta find a way to move that. Yes, autonomous vehicles will create efficiencies. But what we found out is that when autonomous vehicles come in, just like we found out with rideshare, um, rideshare has increased congestion in places, especially such as Manhattan and high dense areas. Why? Because while they create efficiencies and autonomous vehicles, it, studies show that they'll, they'll be more 25, 20 to 30 percent more efficient. But there's a law of, of nature in transportation. If you make transportation easier, guess what people do? They travel more. What we found out is that people take more trips with, with Uber and Lyft than they would have driven. I, I, I experienced this with my grandchildren, my, with my son one time. We're, we're over in Phoenix at something. And he gets this call, and it's my 14-year-old granddaughter. And my son goes, you want to go where? <laughs> OK. Uh, you want to go to it's, it's some, you know, it's one of these recreational places. Uh, who's going? OK, you and your three friends. All right, I'll, over, I'll, I'll, order, I'll order the lift. So my son gets on his phone and orders her a lift. And she goes, well, mom and dad aren't there to take them. But the trip, so the trip would not have happened but for Uber and Lyft. So it happens. We're finding that studies have shown that that is much more frequent. And it's going to get more. So what you get is that, is that the studies so far have shown that while autonomous vehicles, for example, increase efficiencies 25%, they also increase number of trips by 20 to 25%.
So we think that that, that may be a push. We're going to have to figure out a way to move more people longer distances through ever congested um, thing. And as we showed you uh, on Central Avenue, the reality is, is that light rail now on Central Avenue moves twice the number of people that is possible with just cars. It's just, a, it's real estate. It's a matter of space. And I can put 200 people in a light rail vehicle in the same, in, I, there's, a, there's a really good visual that I could put up. I think 200 people in the same space that you can fit like 20 cars. It's that dramatic. So I, I think that high capacity transit in whatever form is going to be a player for a long time. Thank you for your leadership. I could tell you're quite passionate about it. <laughs> Probably too much so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I, Scott, we uh, are all the beneficiaries of great planning that has come before us. And we stand on the, on the shoulders of giants like you and others that have uh, paved a, a great way for us. And, I think we are, in this region, we are somewhat spoiled. Uh, we're, we're well served when it comes to transportation. But there was a time before that where traffic was bad and, and that provoked the voters to pass Prop 400 and we've all been the beneficiaries of that. We're now coming to the end of Prop 400. The next uh, challenge that we face is a Prop 400 extension in 2022. I believe that is when that election we're hoping to, to so see. planning on. And so the, I think the question that we have and that we share with you is what do we need to do for the next generation of transportation planning? You, you mentioned a few things that I wrote down here that, that we as a, as a region and as a city want to make sure that we, we advocate for when we're crafting the Prop 400 extension so the people who live in Mesa have some incentive to vote for that, ex, uh, that extension. Uh, the Rio Salado uh, streetcar extension seems like a great idea. The Fiat, the ex getting a, a a loop up to the Fiesta area, expanding the bus routes to, as you indicated, the, a third of uh, the the third uh, eastern part of Mesa is underserved, and when it comes to bus routes. But I, I, while you're here. What else should we be mindful of from your perspective as we advocate for what should be included in the Prop 400 extension? Well, it's a great question, and you stated the, the, the situation very well. Uh, it's easy to, to put transportation issues uh, when congestion is horrible, when you're underbuilt, and that was the case in Prop 300. Prop 400 was a little different because we, we had built a lot of freeways, but there was a lot unbuilt. Uh, the South Mountain Freeway wasn't done. A lot of the widenings weren't done. Uh, pro, uh, uh, Loop 303 out in the West Valley wasn't done. A lot of work yet to be done. And then the introduction of light rail into the system uh, was a big change. The Prop 400 extension is building upon a, a great freeway system. We've got one of the best freeway systems uh, around. Uh, a very successful um, expansion of bus. One third of Prop 400 funds go to transit. The, be the backbone of our, of our bus system, our regional bus system, is based on Prop 400 money with cities supplementing that in their own and paying for additional service in their own. But there's some communities in our, in our valley that don't put any of their local monies into, trans into transit. They have very limited bus service. Um, but the th there's two things. Number one, Prop 400 to get passed was very rigid. And you had a 20-year plan that was set in place. And one of the complaints that I get, especially from West Valley, is, hey, I want to expand and, and move money to do this. Can't do it. Because the rules were set up that, that you, these buckets are established and these firewalls are established and I cannot move money at all. So the first thing is, is to recognize that the world is going to change a lot. And it runs counter to the, to, to, the, uh, in, to the intuition that we would leave flexibility in a long-term funding plan. But we have to do it. And even down at the legislature, the most conservative are recognizing that the rigidity now does not allow us to adequately um, meet the change, you know, how this valley has grown, new technology. Thing. I can't tell you what the system's going to be like 20 years from now. I know what components will be, how they'll interplay. You need that flexibility. The other thing is to recognize this is not an either or. And this was what worries me a lot. You go to the legislature and you talk about 400 extension, there's one issue, light rail. One issue. And the people that get most exercised about that are the people in Peoria and Avondale. And I said, but you'll never have light rail in Peoria. Maybe in Avondale, but not in Peoria. And I wouldn't support it. It doesn't make sense. Well, but we don't like it. Well, but why should you dictate for Mesa and for Phoenix where there are, if that's the, the mold they choose to invest, because we're not going to build any freeways in Mesa, 
but we're gonna generate a lot of revenue and we're gonna become more dense, more centralized. I believe that it, it you know, this, for example, the streetcar, how do you, how do you fit 50,000 people at Novus Innovation when you run out of real, you don't have real estate to build any more roads. What, undo the Salt River? You can't do that. So, so rail may be the best solution. We have to keep our minds open that this is a regional plan which will include a variety of, of modes. We should invest heavily in autonomous vehicle technology, absolutely. We should invest in, in local, uh, you know, even scooters and things like that. Whether we like it or not, those are gonna be a major part of our transportation system because people, we can't take a train everywhere. Can't take a bus. And if we want people to be able to use it, one of the greatest detriments to people using public transportation is it's just not convenient. If, I, if my office is two miles away from a train station, I'm not gonna take light rail. Because I'm not gonna walk two miles even today. And I certainly won't do it in the summer. But if I can get off the train as, as the consultant in McKinsey, and this is how I believe it'll work, if I can get off the train and literally walk out to an Uber, Lyft, scooter, whatever it is, and be at my office and have total confidence, all of a sudden that becomes an option. So I think that as we move forward, we have to keep it open and realize that this is a, this is a multimodal mix system that has many different needs. And whatever that community decides is best for them should be supported on a regional basis. I tell people when I was mayor, I was one of the biggest supporters of Loop 303. I don't know how many of you have driven on the Loop 303, I certainly don't do it very often, but I recognized it was important to that part of the community and to that area. And I know people will say, for example, with light rail, yeah, but it only carries 1% of the, of the traffic. Well, the Loop 303 only carries 1% of the total car traffic. So should we eliminate that? No, because it's an important part of a consolidated, full transportation system. And as we move forward, I think that's where the discussion has to be. Not what do we need today, but what are our children and our grandchildren gonna need 10 years from now? And recognize that they're gonna travel very differently than we travel. And they're gonna travel on multiple modes. My, my kids and grandkids have no problem getting on, taking uh, Uber to the light rail station, getting on light rail and going into a game in downtown Phoenix. <clears throat> I've, I've heard you mention scooters several times, and uh, as you probably know, the, uh, a week ago we had a, a long uh, session discussing the potential for an ordinance in Mesa to regulate scooters, and that's coming back to us and again probably in another week or two, and we'll, I think uh, the consensus here is that we're, we're going to move forward with that. From your perspective, do you have any opinions on the details of not just scooters, but maybe the, these last mile uh, alternatives, uh, but particularly uh, that seems to be the issue du jour uh, of those types of vehicles. Yeah, I, you know, and it's funny that we're talking about scooters because, you know, I remember when I was, when, when I had teenagers, it was razors. And I think it's a lot of our ordinances go back clear to the old motorized razors of 25 years ago. Um, last mile is gonna develop, the market is gonna develop that. I'm not gonna develop that, you're not gonna develop that, and we're not gonna control that. We, you just need to realize that. Whether it's scooters or rickshaws or, or, or remember the fight against Uber and Lyft, it's gonna happen. Uh, you know, one of our big challenges that we have, and I, I think you, in your discussion on, uh, on paratransit, is that Uber and Lyft has so changed the, the, uh, the ta taxi cab business, they used to play a huge role in our paratransit. Well, we can't get taxi cabs anymore, so now Lyft carries about 70% of our, of our um, ride choice customers. You know, that shows you how this is gonna evolve. Things in the market are going to evolve and it's up to us to just figure out how to mesh them in as best we can. And, and I don't know, uh, who would have foretold that, that five years ago that motorized scooters would, would perhaps be a major part of things. I've gone to other cities, I was in Nashville recently, and it was amazing how further along they are in their scooter use than we are and that they truly use it to get around downtown Nashville and places like that, it's gonna be here, it's gonna happen. And that's why we've done things like, uh, like partner with Waymo. We're embracing this change and seeing how we can best consolidate it. And I actually believe that what the McKinsey uh, consultant said, I do believe that when you leave your house, you'll get on here and you'll plan your trip out and it might include three or even four different modes of transportation, depending on where you're going. If you're going five blocks, you may get to downtown Phoenix and there'll be a scooter or a rickshaw or whatever is waiting for you. If you're going two miles, it'll be an Uber or Lyft. Uh, don't know, but uh, we need to embrace that as opposed to trying to, 
Uh, so these cities, and I know there's some cities who say, no, we're going to exclude this. Good luck. You're not going to win that battle long term. The, mar the market, meaning our constituents, will prevail, just like they've prevailed with Uber and Lyft. We, we sort of forget when the taxi companies really worked hard to try and exclude them. And there, even New York City tried to exclude Uber and Lyft, and they're still trying. You're going to lose that battle. So, because that's not what our constituents are demanding. They want more flexibility, more options. And we appreciate that, and we, uh, we believe that will better serve our public. Great. Thank and you very much. I Jen. do have one comment or uh, discussion. As we look at the rising cost of housing, and I personally think there's going to be even a more of a push or increase for transit, because the correlation there between housing and transit. If families were able to go down to one car or no car, those costs, they're able to apply to housing. As much as we try to have, a, you know, housing to be affordable and attainable, it's going to be an increasing challenge, I think. And is there a correlation? Is there studies? Is, uh, what are your thoughts on that? It, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because just recently uh, San Diego uh, changed their zoning ordinance just in the last week or two. Uh, to where in certain areas of, of town, they do not require, there's a zero parking requirement for apartment complexes. Uh, and they follow up on, I think, San Francisco, Seattle, some of these really mega high priced. Uh, there's a debate over whether that will work. You know, um, I, I think absolutely you're going to have people who choose to live in a dense area who will not buy a car, and they won't have to. Uh, what the city can do to work that, I don't know whether going, and the big argument against going from this standard to zero is probably a little too drastic. Why? As I've said, the technology and human behavior hasn't quite caught up. We don't have a transit system right now that would support somebody completely going carless. They've got to have an option. Well, with Uber and Lyft, they do have an option, but it's a very expensive option. I think what you're going to see is if, if we're, whatever the council is 10 years from now, my guess is when they have a, an apartment complex in front of them and we don't have the, our planning director here. Uh, but if we have that in, my guess is that the parking requirements for any development, especially housing, are going to be much different than they are today. And we will probably move to the point where, why do you need a parking lot when people who will live there have all these other options and can use them? I, I see that in the future. And not in the not so distant future, because some cities right now are trying it. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Jeremy. Good morning, Scott. I got uh, one question for sure. you. So I know that uh, in the private sector, obviously, we're seeing a huge investment in uh, autonomous vehicles. Yeah. From your perspective, have you guys invested any amount of capital in uh, making the light rail system autonomous and completely removing the driver? And from my amateur perspective, it would seem that something like that would be a lot easier because all a light rail is doing is uh, stop or go, right? You're not, you don't have to control the car to turn left or right or all these other measures. So I'm just curious what investments you guys have personally made in the autonomy. It's interesting you ask that. We've been involved in several national groups and, and other systems getting together and some with the private sector about that concept. Technologically, we could probably do it right now. You know, there's a lot of, you know, the SkyTrain is autonomous. Uh, a couple of issues that, that we deal with is that in our system, because we go through intersections and that, um, the, re the federal regulators, because now we fall under federal regulation, as you can imagine, are very reluctant to cede control when you interact with traffic and with pedestrians. If you have a completely closed system like SkyTrain, that's easy because you don't have that interference. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing that we look at is that our, what are we saving and how are we making it easier? Uh, you know, our number one cost in buses and trains, and one reason why trains are more efficient than buses is that the labor, uh, the operators, they're, they're, they're a big chunk of our cost. If you eliminate the operator, your costs go down. But on a train, are you really going to put a train with up to 200 people with no supervision and nobody there? That, that seems unlikely. So we might move from operators to conductors and, and more customer service. Uh, but we have looked at it. We have invested in... We haven't put any money toward the technology because the private sector is doing that, but we are very much involved in those discussions. But we have to get over that regulatory. And I think that at some point it will happen. Um, you know, like airliners and even long trains, we're going to positive train control, things like that. But every time there's a big train accident, 
the odds of going toward a completely autonomous train are reduced significantly. There's just the fear that you may, that you, if you remove the human element, that somehow that's your ultimate stopgap. So we may have a train that completely drives itself, but it'll be like the Waymo car now. You'll still have a human sitting there. That's, that's where we are right now. But yes, there, is a tech, there, are, there are a lot of groups that are talking about putting technology. As a matter of fact, we've talked with Waymo about the transition. Waymo is interesting because they're building a technology bit platform that can, be, that can be put on anything. Can be put on a truck, can be put on a train, can be put on obviously a car. And so I think that what you'll see is that these, this technology will be available for, for our trains, certainly our microbuses, but even buses, circulators. Uh, we see autonomous vehicles being very good <coughs> with a circulator. The question is from the safety and the comfort and the regulatory, federal regulatory, who can we, how fast will that go? Right, so I think on the Waymo side, what we see to create that transition is uh, an autonomous vehicle, but a driver that can take control right. back at any second, right? So at what point would, or is there no, or a limited ROI there where you don't forecast that at some point we'll have a light rail system where we have an operator that's sitting there, it's driving itself, but they have the ability to take control at, at, at any given minute. Because obviously you have to uh, test out the technology yeah. with a, a stopgap uh, in place, right, which ultimately becomes the human. I would guess as the technology becomes more prevalent, that will be a requirement. And 10, 15 years from now, it would not surprise me if all of our trains are not autonomous with a safety driver there, because from a safety standpoint. Um, you know, you may not realize it, but if you're on an Airbus plane, it's basically an autonomous plane. It can actually even land itself. Uh, so why do you have a pilot? Well, as I talked to one pilot for, at the time, US Airways, he said, I'm a manager, I'm, I'm hardly a pilot. You have a pilot so that when flocks of seagulls fly into your engines and it dies, you have someone like Solon, Captain Solenberger who can take it and figure out, okay, I'm gonna land it in the Hudson, which a computer would never do. And so that's, that's why you have the, the, the pilot there. But literally, I mean, I've been in the simulators, you can take off and fly and, and load it in a computer and never, it will even land it and break and stop right on the runway. That exists right now in airlines, but you still gotta have the pilot to handle that situation. I think, uh, you know, within 20 years, that'll be commonplace on trains, sure. if not sooner. I'm just wondering at any point, like when do you guys plan on transitioning or partnering with Waymo? Is there like a date where you're like, in 2022, we're gonna start trying to roll out this technology to see if it's- We have not set that date, but we have had discussions with our manufacturers, uh, Siemens and Brookville, who are building our streetcar and that, about the ability to put that technology in trains that we're ordering two to five years from now. So we're already having those discussions. Gotcha. And so uh, <coughs> the other part unrelated is when I look at, when I think issues with uh, transportation and population, I always think of countries like China where they're four <coughs> times uh, the size of the United States, right? Uh -huh. So when I look at China, I see mass production of electric buses seems to be the path that China's going down combined with uh, <coughs> high speed rail systems. Right. Uh, when we talk about the federal funds that are available are those funds available to invest in things like electric buses or maybe even to the next extent, uh, autonomous electric buses, right? But electric buses being uh, the requirement before you can even turn it into being autonomous. The federal government already has an, has an aggressive program to encourage electric buses. Uh, we have looked at electric buses in our area. Right now we're 93% natural gas, which is good for the city of Mesa because we buy a lot of natural gas from city of Mesa. Uh, but uh, electric buses are a thing, they're, they're coming, um, and the federal government is involved in that. We have actually tested electric buses in our environment, and we found, for example, we did a test uh, summer before last. We, of course, we test them in July, uh, that's the biggest thing, and we found that the electric bus that was rated for 220 miles got 70 miles, because our environment is, is tough. Uh, there's no doubt that battery technology will change, and it'll catch up with that. So other areas are moving toward electric uh, buses. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the federal government is, a, is an active participant in that. We are waiting till that technology grows to the point where we can operate a bus in Mesa in July and not have to shed load because the first thing you got to shed is guess what? Air conditioning. Uh, that was one of the big concerns about, our, uh, about our, uh, the, the Tempe streetcar. And we had to go through gobs of testing to figure out 
whether people would be stranded. And we realize that uh, that is still a possibility, but luckily they'll be stopped in traffic and they can get off. Uh, if they're in the middle of a freeway and that happens, that's more problematic. But yes, we're very aggressive in that. We want to we want to look at that. We feel good about our, our about our uh, about our natural gas because they do have a, a very good footprint. They're about, as a matter of fact, the overall footprint for our natural gas bus right now is less than an electric bus because of the manufacturing and, and how efficient uh, they are. Uh, but that's something that you'll see in the future. And I, once again, in, not in 10 years. We buy buses right now. We're buying, uh, between us and the city of Phoenix, 450 buses. Those buses will last 10 to 12 years. My guess is in the generation after that, you'll probably see us more into electric buses than we are now because I think the technology will have improved that much that so you can use it even here in Arizona. And on more longer hauls, uh, high-speed rail, can you talk to the point of, have you guys, uh, is there any talks between, you know, was there Phoenix and Tucson or maybe uh, Mesa and Glendale? Will we see any type of high-speed rail or some, you know, future investment in that regard? We've actually, uh, MAG has done studies on the commuter corridor, which is uh, basically the diagonal between Queen Creek and Peoria, the diag diagonal, and uh, out west, out Buckeye with the BNSF lines. Those studies have been done, and we find that it would be feasible around here. Uh, the challenge we have is this Phoenix initiative, if that goes through, that kills it, uh, and also uh, working with the railroads. Uh, they've got to move their, their hub system out of Phoenix before that's a, a feasible possibility. And they, all, they both want to do it. Both Union Pacific and BNSF would like to move their yards outside the area and then truck. That's, that's the way of the future for trains, but they haven't done that yet. Um, between inner city, ADOT has actually done a study on uh, inner city trains between here and Tucson. It certainly is feasible. It's more feasible here than it is in other areas. One of the big reasons why California is dying is not that the train is not, you can't build it. It's just that with California, with all the environmental and all of the regulatory and everything, it literally collapses under its own weight. And that's the biggest challenge we have to high-speed rail in the U.S. in general, is that where China can basically just say, yeah, that farm, I, I want it for the rail tracks. Here, you're moving. We have to actually go through, and that increases the cost and the, and the everything so far. So uh, I think that uh, although it would be cheaper, literally, if you've driven from here to L.A., you realize that I-10 is about at capacity. It would be cheaper to build a high-speed rail from here to L.A. than it would be to rebuild I-10. Uh, it costs less. But politically and everything, environmentally and everything, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy lift. And I, I've been in, involved in the High-Speed Rail Alliance, and, and there's places, once again, where it works, it's better. There's other places that it doesn't. And my last question, I know that you're more in tune with the industry, and I know in Scottsdale now, you know, at Fry's, you can basically order your groceries, and not only are they delivered, but they're delivered <clears throat> by a robot car without yeah. any humans in it whatsoever. Uh, so my first request would be, uh, can you help us bring that uh, technology out uh, to Mesa? And uh, the second part of that is, when can we expect to see a Waymo car uh, driving by itself without anybody in the driver's seat? Um, I can't answer for Waymo, although I do know that, once again, that last hurdle, which is a big hurdle. We're there. Technologically, Waymo right. could be driving right now. But I think the Uber experience has... I think moved everything back a long time bef because I don't know that anybody right now would be willing to completely trust their technology. And they're, as, I, as in the example I gave you, I, I know that we've talked to Waymo about that, and that's a concern, although I can't speak on their behalf. But technologically, they could do it. And they could technically do it now, but their liability and safety and other issues that I think stand in the way. Um, you know, it's interesting you, you mentioned Fry's. I actually believe we will be a player in local autonomous because if you look at some of the little micro buses that are autonomous, neighborhood circulators, I think we, we meaning public transportation and, and Valley Metro are going to be the ones that introduce those or work those. And you'll see them in places. You may see a circulator in Las Cendas, for example, somewhat of a controlled area where they don't have public transit now, well, now you'll see maybe those autonomous microbuses running around there. Why? You don't have to pay for a driver. You can put more frequency. These are, what, these are little buses that carry 10 to 12 people. And you can put them on a route, a circulator route. I think you'll see that, and that will be a precursor to opening sort of the gates to a lot of other uses for autonomous. There's no doubt that when we look at autonomous, we look at our, our top two areas that we're looking at adding is on those expanding services 
And, I, and you may never see a bus line going into East Mesa. You may see a lot of little tiny micro uh, circulator lines that connect to bus lines because we can do them less expensively from a capital standpoint and from a, uh, an operating standpoint. And the other thing is in paratransit, the, the ability to expand services and we can do that better with an autonomous vehicle than we can uh, with having all of our drivers uh, be around. That, that's a limiting factor. Sure. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think this has been a great meeting. We need to discuss transportation policy, uh, particularly with the Prop 400 extension on the horizon so that we're well prepared and we're advocates for our region as we prepare for that important election. And remember, it's, it's a, not an either or. It's an all-inclusive, all, all the above, and whatever works for your community and then looking for the, toward the next generation. Great. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope we can do this again before too long. Uh, and get caught up, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on somewhere in and around May 18th. Yes. Uh, for when we celebrate uh, the, the next uh, celebration of bringing the light rail uh, further into Mesa. So, thanks again for uh, thank you. all you've thanks done for, for us today in. and, for, and uh, prior to today as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council. The next item on our agenda is item three acknowledge receipt of board minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson. Um, before we get into uh, approving those, I just wanted to make a comment on, on 3B on the Human Relations Advisory Board. As I was going through reading the minutes, I noticed on in section nine, um, there's a, they, they make reference to uh, House Bill 2586, and I just want to make sure that it's noted that 2586 is a water bill. Um, that was introduced by Representative Cook. So I don't know if, if this was <clears throat> back in January when they had the meeting, if this was something else and it became a striker. Um, but I would caution advisory boards taking stances on House and Senate bills without first checking with um, city staff to ensure that um, this is something that the city is going to be okay with uh, going forward. So do you believe there's an error in the minutes, or you just I don't necessarily know on? that there's an error, Mayor, I, but um, I, I just noticed that there's a House Bill 2586, and one of the members had asked uh, and implored the board members to reach out to their elected representatives to lobby for this type of bill for House Bill 2586. And that's, uh, that House bill is, is a, a water bill that was introduced for, by Representative Cook for Pinell County uh, water replenishment. And uh, so that could have ripple effects on the city of Mesa. Um, and so when it, it, I, I'm a little skeptical when advisory boards start taking stances on House and Senate bills outside of, you know, this certainly um, would appear outside of their, outside of their realm of, of what they should be doing. Um, but more so that, um, that, you know they're they're taking a stance on a, on a house bill, and I don't know what the original intent was in January, but uh, it could have been certainly been a striker that just had the language changed. But when I looked it up uh, yesterday, it was a water bill that was introduced by Representative Cook for Pinal County uh, replenishment, and so again that could have ripple effects, long long-standing ripple effects. Uh, negative impact on uh, the city of Mesa. So we just need to make sure that our advisory boards are using caution when they're, when they're uh, supporting or uh, opposing uh, House and Senate bills, make sure they're running those through our intergovernmental uh, um, group uh, before they move forward on stuff like that. Okay, so if I, I, I mean, obviously we're free to disagree with opinions expressed by our board members in the minutes and, and uh, we will, can and will do that, but if there's an error in the minutes, I think this is where we can comment on that. <laughs> let's just go, we'll go back to the, okay. yeah. so let, let's, let's check on party. that, but. It'd be odd, that'd be, uh, it's kind of an odd what, bill for them to even, pay, you know, yeah. regardless. <laughs> well, that's why I was wondering if maybe if it was a yeah. striker back just, in we'll January. Go, so. We'll go yeah. back and see what we can find out. All right, so uh, Mr. Smith, did we go ahead and approve the board yeah. minutes with the understanding that, uh, that the clerk's office will check and see if uh, we got the, the number right on the, on the minutes? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, and second, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Item four, hear reports on meetings and conferences attended. Council, anything you'd like to share with us? All right, Mr. Brady, uh, can you help us with our schedule? Yeah, just our next study session will be March 14th, so we'll see you then.
Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Freeman and Mr. Thompson. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>